a member may speak more than once in a single debate. At the end of a debate on a group of amendments, I shall call the member who moved <coughs> the leading amendment again. Before that person sits down, they will need to indicate if they wish to withdraw the amendment or to seek a decision. If any member wishes to press any other amendment or new clause in a group to a vote, they need to let me know. I shall work on the assumption that the Minister wishes the Minister to reach a decision on all government amendments if they are tabled. Please note that decisions on amendments do not take place in the order they are debated, but in the order they appear on the amendment paper. In other words, debate occurs according to the selection and grouping list. Decisions are taken when we come to the clause which the amendment affects. I shall use my discretion to decide whether to allow a separate stand par debate on individual clauses and schedules following the debates on the relevant amendments. I hope that uh, explanation is helpful. The committee agreed to programme motion before the oral evidence gathering session, which is printed on the amendment paper. The motion sets out the order in which we have to consider the bill. We begin with clause one of the bill, with which it will be convenient to discuss schedule one as well. The question <coughs> is that clause one stand part of the bill. Minister. Thank you, Mr Stringer, and it is a pleasure to serve under your <coughs> chairmanship and that of your co-chair, Sir David Amos, who took us so ably through the evidence sessions the week before last. At the outset, I would like to emphasise the importance of this bill in delivering the future border and immigration system. It was clear from the EU referendum, and indeed from the many views shared during the Bill's second reading debate and the evidence sessions for this committee, that people want a fair immigration system that works for the whole of the United Kingdom. They want one that attracts talent from around the globe and allows individuals to access the UK based on what they have to offer, not where they come from. We heard many important views on the current and future border and immigration system from witnesses who gave evidence before the committee two weeks ago as well as organisations who have provided written evidence. I am grateful to everyone who took the time to provide their opinions. The views put forward have demonstrated a strong interest in a wide range of immigration issues, as well as on the specific design of the future system. The evidence highlighted the importance of learning lessons from the past <coughs> and ensuring we get things right. There was a clear message emerging on the need to create a fair and simple system, and these are key priorities for me in the design of the future system. As I have said previously, I recognise the immigration rules need to be made simpler, and that is why we have asked the Law Commission to review how the rules could be simplified. I look forward to considering their findings when they are published. Mr Chairman, leaving the European Union means for the first time in over 40 years we can deliver control of immigration by ending free movement. In its place, we will introduce a new system which will level the playing field by ending preferential treatment for EU citizens. It will mean everyone will have the same opportunity to come to the UK, regardless of where they are from. Well, Mr. Sure, I'm grateful to Ms. for giving away, giving away so early on. She's already a couple of times asserted that this will be a level playing field for everybody, but the white paper itself uh, indicates that nationals of different countries will be treated in a different way. There will be, I'm reckoning, preferential treatment for EU nationals for the one year visa and for countries who are already uh, non visa nationals. So, Will she clarify, is she saying everybody's going to be treated exactly the same, or does she accept that the White Paper, in fact, does not set out such an arrangement? Well, this bill certainly does set out that people will be treated in the same way, because, of course, this is a bill simply to end free movement. The White Paper, which was published on the 18th of December, gives us the opportunity to discuss the future system, to discuss uh, how people may be uh, treated from across the globe, to give us the opportunity to discuss where, when trade deals are discussed, whether part of that might include uh, uh, <coughs> treatment within our immigration system. But it is important that we have a system that reflects the skills that people have, that, makes, uh, re that takes recognition of what we need within our economy. And of course, as I have said, this uh, moment where we are uh, seeking through this bill to end free movement is absolutely the opportunity at which we can start to provide that more level playing field. Well, the Minister well, Thank you, uh, Chair, and I thank the Minister for giving away. She's just given the game away, though, hasn't she? Because the manner in which people will be treated will be largely dependent on what the government sees as its interests with regard to trade deals. 
So the idea that the government is telling uh, people that there will be a level playing field is a misnomer, uh, isn't it, Chair? Because actually, what rights people have will be highly dependent on whatever whim occurs to the government in their own incentive on future trade deals. Isn't that right? Just before I call the Minister, this is a good opportunity to remind members of the committee that intervention should be short and to the point. There will be plenty of opportunities for members to catch my eye if they want to make a longer contribution in the debate. Minister. Thank you, Mr Stringer. Um, and I, of course, welcome that this is an opportunity for members to raise their views about the future immigration system. And absolutely far from giving the game away, I think that this is an opportunity through the white paper, and we have said that there will be a year of engagement on it where we can consider all views and where we can reflect that we already have a system where some countries or some nationals from some countries require visas for visits, others do not, where we will be seeking to establish relationships. And these, of course, are all for future negotiation and discussion. But it's absolutely right that as a first step in that process, we listen to what we were told as part of the 2016 referendum <coughs> and we end free movement. <coughs> I want us to continue to be an open, outward-looking and welcoming country. And I want to reiterate what I and my Right Honourable Friend, the Home Secretary, have said many times before. We value immigration and the contribution people have made to our society, to our culture and to our economy. And there are many people, including honourable members on this committee, who are quite rightly interested in the design of the future system. That is why, as I've said, we're engaging on the proposals that were set out in the White Paper, a future skills-based immigration system, which includes sessions which are open to all MPs to discuss specific points of interest on the proposals. And within the last few weeks, I've already held engagement sessions with members on both students and workers. And I believe in the coming days, there is a, another engagement session on asylum. But the purpose of this bill is clear. We are ending free movement and providing the legal framework for the future border and immigration system. And turning to Clause 1, this introduces the first schedule of the Bill, which contains a list of measures to be repealed in relation to the end of free movement and related issues. This clause fulfils a purely mechanistic function to introduce the schedule. It is absolutely the, uh, the bare bones of the Bill, and I am looking forward to uh, having the opportunity either to uh, debate it further with members, or indeed we can address certain aspects through the amendments which undoubtedly will be coming forward to other parts of the bill in due course. But in order to get uh, matters underway, uh, we must first, uh, I must first move Clause 1, and I beg to move that it stands part of the bill. Stuart MacDonald. Oh, sorry. If, if members can stand if they wish to speak. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And let me start by saying that this uh, clauses and this entire bill for that matter puts the cart before the horse. Labour have been clear that our immigration policy is subordinate to our economic and trade policy. The government's position on Brexit on the other has been consistent in just one way. They insist on putting immigration ahead of our economic needs. We simply cannot support measures that would see our country worse off. It is a fact that freedom of movement ends when we leave the single market. But the Prime Minister herself has recognized the need for frictionless trade and has been told categorically by the EU that this cannot be maintained with a, without a close relationship to the single market. If the government cannot yet be clear as to what the final agreement will be on our relationship with the single market, this makes no sense. Until the government gets their ducks in a row, we simply cannot vote for such a measure. The bill also fails to address two major questions facing Parliament. The first is how we will protect the rights of the three and a half million people who have already moved to the UK and made their lives here. During the second reading debate, the Home Secretary said, my message to the three and a half million EU citizens already living here has also been very clear. I, have, I say, you are an incredibly valued <coughs> and an important part of our society. We want you to stay, deal or no deal. That view will not change. 
Yet the government has made absolutely no provisions to protect these citizens in this bill. Would my honourable friend give way? <coughs> Does he agree that this bill would be the ideal opportunity to offer statutory <coughs> reassurance to those three million people and put on the face of the bill the details of the government's settled status scheme and its ongoing pro proposals for protecting those people's rights? Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely agree with my friend and her comments wholeheartedly. Labour has tabled a number of new clauses to this bill which would put the rights of EU citizens into primary legislation. We hope the government will accept them when we get to that point. The second question is, what our new immigration system should be doing going forward? The bill is incredibly flimsy. It is only 16 pages long, which is extraordinary, given it will mean the biggest change to our immigration system in decades. Instead of putting forward a new immigration system that Parliament could discuss and debate, amend and improve, this bill grants powers to ministers to introduce whatever system they like through expensive Henry VIII powers. We have been given an indication of what such a system might be like in the white paper the government published in December. In fact, ministers are under no obligation to use these powers to implement that system. If they do implement the system described in the white paper, it will spell disaster for our economy and our society. We will get into these issues in more depth in subsequent debates, but expert witnesses at our evidence sessions criticize almost all aspects of the government's plans. The 30,000 threshold would be a disaster for business and our public services like the NHS. The 12-month visa will lead to exploitation. Labor has no problem with an immigration that will treat all migrants the same, no matter where they came from. But this is not actually the system the government is proposing. The white paper is explicit that there will be certain visas and conditions that will only apply to people from low-risk countries, a categorization that the government is not at all transparent about. Apart from these two glaring absences, the bill before us fails to address a litany of issues with our immigration system, some of which Labour has sought to remedy through our amendments. Before I conclude my remarks, I have two questions I would like the Minister to address when she makes her remarks. First, under what circumstances would the government actually use the powers in this bill? We have heard that this is a contingency bill. So if there is a withdrawal agreement, and so a withdrawal and implementation bill will be Will the government use powers in that bill to repeal free movement? And second, can the provisions in this bill lead to a change in immigration law that can affect non-EEA migrants? Could the government use the powers in the bill to amend immigration legislation affecting non-EU citizens? As the minister will know, the government is asking for extensive Henry VIII powers. During our committee meetings, Adrian Barry, Steve Walt Simmons and Martin Hoare, all experts in immigration law, confirmed to me that the powers in this bill could be used to make legislations affecting non-EU citizens. Is the minister willing to contradict these experts? And would she agree that if it is indeed the case that the powers in this bill could be used to make legislation affecting non-EU citizens, then the scope of this bill is in fact much wider than the end of free movement. Thank you very much indeed, Mr String. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. Could I also start by uh, thanking the clerks for uh, working their way through a mountain of amendments in, in the um, last few days and making them presentable. Thanks to various organisations uh, and individuals for helping with ideas and amendments. Uh, thanks to the Shadow Minister for um, engaging with us very useful over the last couple of days. Um, any flaws with the amendments that we have tabled are uh, my responsibility alone. Um, but finally, I can also thank the Minister who has been very open to discussion, approachable and good humoured as ever. And so um, the fact that I can't stand this bill and utterly oppose it shouldn't be taken uh, personally. I hope that we still will be able to have some useful and constructive uh, debate. Anyway, uh, turning to, to clause one, I'm not going to rehash all the, uh, the points that I made at second reading, but I love free movement. My party 
fully supports it. Um, I pretty much believe it's the best thing since sliced bread, and I would regret that it is in danger of coming to an end. And this is actually going to leave the United Kingdom in an unusual position historically, because this is a country that has, for almost its entire history, allowed certain citizens to come and go without leave, whether they be <coughs> EU citizens, Commonwealth citizens, or before that, absolutely everybody. All the evidence is that free movement is beneficial for us, for growth, for productivity, and for public finances. And in Scotland in particular, it has transformed our demographic outlook. From a country of net emigration, we are now a country of positive in-migration. And of course, the quid pro quo for all this is that we are going to lose our own free movement rights too. My family and I have benefited from me free movement, as I know many members have, including on this very committee. And I regret that this parliament will be pulling up the ladder behind it. I believe the challenges that are often cited in relation to free movement are often challenges that will not be solved by ending free movement, but rather by proper labour market standards and enforcement, by integration strategies and by investment in public services. And neither do the justifications for ending free movement stack up. Indeed, it was striking in the Minister's speech and indeed some of the government speeches uh, during second reading how very little was actually addressed to free movement and the supposed justifications for ending it. I think it was wrong to say that people voted to end free movement because it was not on the ballot paper. To argue the contrary is to argue that almost 100% of Leave voters were motivated by that and that alone, and that is not the case. This is the Prime Minister's red line, it is not the people's red line. And indeed, opinion polls and studies have shown that if it comes to a choice between closer trading relationships with Europe or ending free movement, a closer trading relationship wins. Simply repeating ad nauseum that we are taking back control of our borders is not an argument. Finally, Mr Stringer, this is the most bizarre moment for MPs to consider voting to end free movement. Parliament is hopefully on the verge of taking control. Who knows what trading arrangements may be secured, perhaps involving free movement. A people's vote is even more on the cards than we had uh, than at the time of the, the second reading. And as the Shadow Minister said, this would be putting the cart before the horse. Let's sort out what our negotiating position is first, and then we can decide what that means for free movement afterwards. If the public are happy enough to retain free movement for a closer trading arrangement, then it is wrong for MPs to rule it out at this stage. There is no need to rush through the end of free movement, even if we do leave in a month's time. And so for these reasons, my party believes this clause should not stand part of the bill. Here, here. Thank you very much, Mr Stringer. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. <coughs> May I echo uh, the comments of the Honourable Member uh, for Cumbernauld South? and Kirk and Tillich East in thanking the Minister for being so open to colleagues uh, in preparing for this bill and the debates uh, over the next two weeks. I too believe that freedom of movement has been good for our country and very particularly for my constituency. We are a proud manufacturing constituency, we are a, a constituency which offers many skilled jobs and we have relied heavily over the years on the skills and talents of EEA nationals coming to work in our industries. And indeed, it's very clear that my region, the northwest of England, is one of the regions destined to suffer most economically from the loss of access to EEA labour under free movement rules. May I echo the remarks uh, of the honourable gentleman in terms of public opinion in relation to freedom of movement? <coughs> Um, a couple of years ago, I had the pleasure of participating in a citizens' assembly organised by the Constitution <coughs> Unit uh, of the University College of London. And the question that that assembly was asked to address, among other questions, was what kind of immigration arrangements did they want with the European Union after Brexit? This was a deliberative process um, carried out with a sample, a representative sample of over 100 individuals, exactly mirroring the demographic of the referendum uh, electorate and those who participated uh, in terms of results, uh, leave or remain, in terms of geography, ethnicity, age, background, and so on. And after two weekends of extensive deliberation, the conclusion that this assembly reached was that they were happy with the current free movement arrangements between uh, EU countries, including the UK. They just wanted them to be properly enforced. And as we heard in oral evidence, uh, Mr Stringer, a couple of weeks ago, the government has had the opportunity for many decades to impose, for example, registration conditions that we've never used and which could have offered greater reassurance to the public that the country has a grip on the immigration system. Now, I want to express some concerns, if I may, Mr Stringer, about the implications of um, uh, 
endorsing Clause 1 today uh, without knowing what we're going to have in its place. The Government has announced a scheme uh, for uh, a settlement process for EEA nationals already resident in the UK, either applying for settled status if they can demonstrate five years' residence uh, exercising treaty rights or pre-settled status on the way to achieving that. And it's good that EU nationals have already begun to register under that scheme, um, and many have managed to do that very straightforwardly, Mr Stringer. But some, we know uh, from the evidence that we've heard and read, have experienced difficulties. And that's why I feel very strongly, and I know we'll be debating this later in this committee, that we have to do something in this bill, Mr Stringer, if we're going to um, apply Clause 1 to put on the face of the bill something that protects in statute the rights of all those people so that they're not left in sort of some sort of limbo or black <coughs> hole until we get to the new immigration system that the government negotiates, perhaps by 2021. And I want to express some very particular concerns, if I may, about the implications of Clause 1 in the event that we don't reach a deal for the transition phase, which, after all, we're only five weeks away from needing to achieve, and the situation that that could leave European Union nationals in. And in particular, those who arrive after Brexit Day of the 29th of March, but before we have that new immigration system in place. We know, because the government has announced this, um, that the intention is to introduce a model of European temporary leave to remain, uh, which would be granted uh, by way of a visa for up to 36 months from the date of application, um, and would apply to all EU nationals arriving after the 29th of March and staying for more than three months. But, Mr Stringer, the combination of Clause 1 of this bill and the government's announcements so far on that system mean that there are a number of concerns that, that I think leave us in a legal black hole. In particular, um, the Minister was good enough to answer to a number of written questions which I posed to her about the scheme, uh, and I received her answers on the 12th of February. And if I may, I'd just like to probe a little further uh, on some of the answers that I received. Uh, first of all, I, I think I'm right that the European Temporary Leave to Remain visa is a non-extendable visa and anyone on this visa will need to transfer to a new visa category uh, when the new UK immigration system comes into effect. But that means that for now, uh, with the effect of Clause 1, um, they will be left in a very uncertain position uh, as to whether they will be able to stay longer than the 36 months that they will achieve under the European Temporary Leave to Remain visa, with no guarantee uh, that they would be able to switch to a new kind of visa under the new immigration regime. Secondly, um, having looked carefully at the Minister's written answers to me, I'm not clear whether time spent on a European Temporary Leave to Remain visa post Clause 1 and before the new immigration system takes effect would count towards an application for indefinite leave to remain in due course. If it doesn't, <coughs> my understanding is that individuals working on a temporary leave to remain visa would actually have fewer rights than do e non-EU nationals now on Tier 2 visas. And I'd be grateful if the Minister could confirm my understanding and perhaps say more about the Government's intention in relation to that. There's a particular worry, Mr Stringer, as we heard in oral evidence, uh, about students starting courses in 2019-20 or 2020-21, where those courses are longer than three years in length. And if this clause is passed uh, in this bill in the next few weeks, students starting this September will not have certainty about um, whether they will be able to complete their courses in some cases, because a 36-month visa may not be sufficient. For example, that will cover, as um, colleagues from the Scottish National Party uh, will know, all undergraduate degrees in Scotland. It will cover medicine and dentistry courses, nearly all engineering courses, any course with an integrated master's or placement period, most PhD programmes, and we're already seeing a fall in the numbers of students uh, at Russell Group universities coming from the EU to study in our Ru Russell Group universities at PhD level. And students on the European Temporary Leave to Remain visa would not be entitled to a period of post-study work leave on this visa and would therefore again have fewer rights than non-EU nationals on a tier for visa because undergraduates on such a visa for a three-year course are granted four additional months leave after the course end dates. We also don't know uh, from the Minister's written answer to me exactly what fee will be charged and most concerning of all perhaps is the position that, um, that this limbo is going to create for employers. It will not be possible I think Mr Stringer for employers to check 
Who's here as a European national, European Union national, with a right to settled status, but they just haven't applied for it yet, because after all, they have until 2021 to do so? Who's here in the first three months of a visit, having arrived after the 29th of March? And who's been here for longer than three months and has not chosen or not been aware that they need to apply for a European temporary leave to remain visa. And this puts employers in a very difficult position because while we've heard very good assurances from the Home Secretary that there's no expectation that employers should be checking EU nationals in this period, they will nonetheless, if they employ someone who is not entitled to be working in this country, potentially be at risk of com committing an offence under our criminal law. And we heard in oral evidence, Mr Stringer, from Hilary Brown and from James Porter, that there is very considerable confusion among employers about what they need to check and whether they would be checking and what it is that they would be looking for. So I'd be really grateful if the Minister could say a little bit more in her response about what support is going to be given to employers in this inter intervening period. She mentioned uh, in the written answer that I received from her that guidance would be produced, and I'm very grateful to hear that, but it would be very helpful, I think, to the committee and, more importantly, to employers and individuals if she could say a little more about what that guidance will contain. In the meantime, Mr Stringer, and in conclusion, it seems to me that the European Temporary Leave to Remain visa, combined with Clause 1 of this bill, simply leaves us with a system that isn't fit for purpose. It will create extra bureaucracy for the Home Office without actually giving them any more grip on who is here legitimately if there's no mechanism uh, by which employers or landlords, for example, are expected to check. And it really troubles me that the Home Office is adding another burden to its administration systems that will not help it to uh, process, for example, the settled status scheme that we all welcome as smoothly as possible. It's, in that, um, it's for that reason, Mr Stringer, therefore, that I feel very strongly that to um, endorse Clause 1 now uh, would be premature uh, and it causes me very deep concern and I hope the Minister will respond to the points that I have raised. Thank you, Chair, and um, I join uh, colleagues in <coughs> the, um, the clerks and the team for the work that they have done. Um, and um, I want to just make a few remarks, particularly um, on the economic <coughs> arguments that are sometimes made for Clause 1. Um, I have no doubt, Mr Stringer, that we will spend much time debating some of the points uh, that I am about to make, but start as you mean to go on. I guess. Um, firstly, I would say on the timing of this bill, I profoundly agree um, with my colleague from Stretford and Anston. It seems absolutely bizarre to me that anyone would think it was acceptable to remove uh, with one clause of this bill an entire set of rights that all citizens in uh, this country enjoy by reciprocity with the European Union and European Union citizens enjoy in this country and replace them with nothing, just the promise of a white paper. Um, we have no set timescale for the introduction of any new immigration system, uh, Mr Stringer. So we are saying to people, all of the current rights you have are going to be removed and will rep be replaced at some point in the future. We don't know when, and we don't know what they'll be, but bear with us whilst we sort this out. Thank you, Wade. I will, of course. Thank you, Thomas Simmons. My good Marlborough friend for giving way. Can she think of any realistic argument why the government, given they say they want to guarantee the rights of EU nationals, wouldn't simply, in Clause 1, do that in legislation now? Alison McGovern. <laughs> well, I can think of a reason. Mr. Stringer, I think it's because they want to take decisions on these rights based on negotiating interests, based on uh, the potential gain that they might get for their agenda. And it seems clear to me that that has always been the manner in which the rights of EU nationals were going to be treated. And warm words, I'm afraid, I don't think are enough. It's perfectly reasonable to say, and I would expect every member of this committee to be able to say, that they personally feel no animus towards uh, EU nationals and that people are welcome uh, in this country. However, it's one thing to say those words. It's another thing 
to do the necessary to guarantee that that is in fact true and I can think of no reason why the government wouldn't do as my honourable friend has suggested. I thank you very much for giving way. And, and does she not agree with me that not only is it unsettling for EU nationals for this not to be on the face of the bill so clearly as it could be, but it's unsettling to businesses yeah. and is, uh, uh, it interrupts business continuity in a way which is not helpful to the UK economy? Alison McGovern. Thank you, Mr Springer. I agree with, uh, with my friend. He, he makes a very good point. Um, I didn't ever think I would be here lecturing the Conservative Party on the needs of British business, but we are where we are. Um, and it's a point that uh, my friend from Stratford and Amsterdam made uh, very well, that actually what we're creating here is not simplicity, it's an extraordinarily high level of uncertainty. And uncertainty is very costly to the British economy. Um, I'm sure we will come to discuss the costs of this Brexit process through this bill. Um, but I think the government could be handling this bill in a much better way. In fact, they could have come up with in a, the immigration white paper long before they actually did. We could have been spending time over the past two and a bit years since the referendum discussing that very thing. But the government have held off and held off and held off and postponed. Uh, and here we are now in this situation where people have no real idea what the situation for EU nationals is going to be. Um, after the end of March, and I think that, Mr. Stringer, is utterly intolerable. I'm Kate Green. I'm grateful to my honourable friend, and she's making a very important point. Would she uh, agree with me that businesses are already, as a result, experiencing labour shortages because the uncertainty means that already EU nationals are choosing not to come to this country to work? I was told just the other day by a food processor in my own constituency, Mr. Stringer, that there's a particular pressure, for example, in the haulage sector now. Yeah. As drivers are not going to be yeah. thank, thank you, Mr. Stringer, and I hear the same. Um, evidence as uh, my friend from Stratford and Ermston, um, we represent the same region, so that's not to be unexpected at all. And many people will say in response to that, well, we should, it should be fine. There's plenty of people in Britain, there's plenty of British people who can do those jobs. But Mr. Stringer, unfortunately, that is to misunderstand the labour market. We have an ageing population, and as we heard in evidence to this committee, the answer for those who want to put up the border and stop people coming here to do a decent and dignified thing of work uh, in our country. The answer they give is what? Raise the pension age. Ask people to work into their 70s. Well, Mr Stringer, you know what? That's all right if you do a desk job where it is not physically tasking. But I don't really want to ask nurses that I represent to work till they're 71 or 72. I don't think that will really be appropriate. So I think my friend makes a very good point. Um, we've talked. She's also talked about the uh, lack of simplicity of the new system. The minister mentioned simplicity on a number of occasions, and the law commissioner are going to look into this, which is a good thing and not before uh, time. But the fact is that free movement, like it or not, provides uh, people with rights that are simple to understand and simple to exercise. So, if we're going to replace that system with a new system. We better have a really good idea now, today, how we're going to give people an equal or hopefully better level of simplicity. Um, I think that for all the reasons that the member for Stratford and Ermston has mentioned, it's absolutely vital for making people's lives simple. And I know that's the best way to make sure that our economy can innovate, can move forward. Mm -hmm. So without a guarantee of an equally or even better, better uh, simple and well understood system, I find it very hard to understand why the government should uh, move clause one at this point. I give way to my honourable friend. Okay, okay. Well, again, she makes a powerful point. It's not just, of course, simple simplicity uh, for business and for our economy, but for families who now, of course, will not be clear on what basis they can have family members come to this country to live with them. Alice McGovern. Thank you, uh, Mr Stringer, and I thank my friend for that intervention. And of course, she's right. All of us will have spent time um, in our surgery with distressed uh, constituents dealing with the complexities of, uh, that their families are facing. And no doubt the Minister um, sees all of that personal and human cost across her desk, and I know she treats it um, with empathy and kindness. So again, it simply makes the point, if we're going to replace a system 
that is simple and straightforward for people to understand so they can plan family life and get on with the things that they want to do in life without constant interference with the government by the government, then I really think we should have a better option on the table for the future than we currently have. Again, Mr Stringer, never thought I'd have to lecture the Tory party about the perils of the government interfering unnecessarily in people's personal lives. But there we are. And finally, Mr Stringer, to conclude, um, some people talk about the uh, economic impacts of immigration and they say that ending free movement was what caused the referendum um, result. As has already been mentioned, there's, you know, that's questionable. It wasn't on the ballot paper and we don't really know. But having stood in general elections uh, three room? times, I will give way. Forgive me, agree with me that in terms of freedom of movement, there was certainly a huge degree of, of confusion, of, of conflation of freedom of movement with the rest of uh, immigration and asylum policy. Uh, not helped by a, a lack of knowledge in this country about how the EU works and operates down to uh, things like the Daily Mail and how it approaches the uh, European Union and the impact, the direct impact on the people within the UK and how it would affect them, how, how they could travel freely across the EU to, to work, travel and to be educated was not known and therefore we can't possibly say that the, that the UK voted to end the Thank you, Chair, and I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his intervention. I was just going to say, and I say in response to him. I mean, it's entirely possible that, that people don't know all the ins and outs of the details of the immigration system, but I honestly wouldn't expect them to. To be quite, It's quite complicated. Um, and having stood in, in three um, general elections in a uh, uh, swing marginal seat, um, I would say that anybody who thinks they can be involved in British politics and not get involved in conversations about immigration is kidding themselves. So we all have to accept um, that it is a, an issue for us. And people will seize on anecdotes. They will say, yeah, yeah, they will yeah. seize on their own personal experience. And that's not illegitimate either. Yeah. You know, people rely on their own <coughs> lived experience. But when it comes to the decisions that we take, it is a mistake to rely on an anecdote. We ought to look at the actual evidence yeah, yeah. of what immigration has done in our labour market. Now, I want to um, raise very briefly the one Bank of England study that found in 2015 a very small effect on the wages um, of those at the lower um, end of the earnings distribution. Um, but it found that that effect uh, was not significant, Mr Stringer, and often this is seized upon as evidence that somehow immigration has had this huge impact um, on people's earnings potential. And I would simply ask people to compare that to what we actually know has happened to wages since the financial crash in 2008. Um, because uh, compared with the trend of 2% annual growth of real wages from 1980 to the early 2000s, pretty regular um, weight annual wage growth, between 2018, uh, to between 2008 and 2014, people's uh, real wages fell, um, and they did so significantly, um, with about a 20% shortfall in what they would have otherwise expected had that real wage growth continued. Actually, if you look at groups in our society, apart from pensioner households, everyone is really no better off than they would have been in 2008. And that demonstrates the, the significance of that impact um, whilst we have been in the European Union demonstrates what, what's happened here is a change in government policy, it's a change in um, the, the decisions that have been made to support people's incomes because real wages have been weakened by rising inflation um, since the 2016 referendum which has had a huge impact um, and depreciation can will lead to rising costs because in the end when we think about people's earnings potential what matters is not the nominal figure of the amount that they've got coming in but what they can buy for it so i would simply say to people who worry about the impact of immigration uh, on wages we should definitely consider it it's it's true that most of all of the studies that have ever investigated this have found that there's no statistically significant impact at the local level of immigration 
um, on the earnings uh, of those in that local economy. However, if you think that's important, that you ignore the impact of uh, prices and what's happened since the referendum, then you are not serious about dealing with poverty in this country. So uh, I think that we have to understand that if we say to people, simply by restricting immigration, we will make the average British person better off, Chair, we are simply offering them a false promise. Thank you, Mr Stringer. And there were a good number of useful and interesting points raised by members. Um, I just want to start off with correcting one point that the Honourable Member for Manchester Gorton made, where he said that it was a fact that free movement would end when we leave the single market. Well, in fact, free movement will, as Honourable Members know, was frozen into UK law last year. So that's why we absolutely need this bill, so that we can end free movement, uh, which will not happen automatically when we leave the EU. And members are right to point out that there may be a gap. There could be a gap either way. It is perfectly feasible that this bill will not gain royal assent until after we have left the EU, or possibly uh, it's uh, certainly feasible to envision the circumstances in which this bill might gain royal assent before we leave the European Union. Uh, but it is an important bill, and uh, although I have been accused of putting the cart before the horse, that's absolutely not the case. It's not premature. It's something that we must do. A number of members raised uh, the rights of the 3.5 million EU citizens living in the UK, and they are absolutely right to do so. Now, they will also know that in a deal situation, it is the withdrawal agreement bill, uh, where we hope very much, uh, I certainly hope very much, in the event of a deal. I'm probably one of the few in this room who have voted consistently for the deal every time it has come before the House. I know that I've got, OK, they're all putting their hands up now. Um, but I certainly have done, and I think it's really important that we secure a deal and in so doing have the withdrawal agreement. I will have the joy of also serving on that bill committee uh, and take through the citizens' rights uh, principles that we are absolutely determined to secure. Of course, members will know, and I don't intend to bore them on this subject, but it is one of my favourites, uh, that we opened the EU Settled Status Scheme last year uh, in its first trial phase. We are now into the third open beta testing phase. I'm not in any way complacent about this, and actually you open these large projects in uh, private beta testing first so that you can iron out the bugs, the problems, uh, the issues that may crop up. And it is uh, fair to say that there have been issues, but also that we have been able to learn from the process, react, uh, I like to think, relatively quickly, iron them out, and I am pleased that so far we have seen 100,000 people go through the process and more applying every single day. Um, you know, that doesn't mean that I'm not alive to the challenges that are part of that. Obviously, 3.5 million is an enormous number, and 100,000, whilst a good start when you're not even in the open uh, phase of the scheme uh, is encouraging, but obviously I know that there is a great deal more to do and I'm sure members will be reassured that we'll be opening the communications uh, programmes very shortly indeed. I think the whip would like to intervene on me, he's yes. gesturing. Thank you. Um, thank you and thank the Minister for um, uh, taking the intervention. Um, we heard quite a lot of evidence um, when we took evidence from people concerned that if we get this wrong at this point we could create another Windrush situation. Mm -hmm further down the line. Can she tell us how that will be prevented? Well, I think the, the Honourable Gentleman raises a really important point, and uh, if we learn one thing from Windrush, and I sincerely hope that we've learned very many more than one things from Windrush, it's that uh, a declaratory system that does not give people the evidence that they need in order to be able to affirm their right to be in the UK, their right to work, to rent property, etc., does not work. Uh, and so that's why we have a scheme which will, uh, I, if I could just finish the point, that's why we have a scheme which I am confident will give people the evidence that they need so that we avoid uh, EU citizens who are here and settled from being in the same situation in the future. And I'm very conscious, and I'm sure members may have heard me say this uh, previously in select committees, is that there will be children uh, of EU citizens living in this country today 
uh, well under the age of 16, perhaps one who is one or two years old. And we all know, and the Honourable Lady from Wirral South mentioned an ageing population and longevity. Well, actually, that's the truth, is it not? That uh, whilst we in this room might be lucky if we get to the la our late 80s, actually there'll be children that live to 100, to 110. Uh, and so it's important that we have something that is enduring, enables them to evidence their right to be here for uh, a century or more. I give away to the Honourable Sure, MacDonald. This is a new argument, I think, that appeared for the first time yesterday at Home Office questions, that because Windrush was what the Minister describes as a declaratory system, that's what caused the problem. That was not what caused the problem. The problem was the lack of evidence. In fact, if it hadn't been, um, at, if they didn't have rights under statute, um, as we would like to see in this statute, they could have been removed ages ago and they wouldn't have been able to rectify the situation altogether. So it's not right to say that the problem um, caused to the Windrush generation was because it was a declaratory system. I disagree with the Honourable Gentleman because, in fact, if we look back to the 71 Immigration Act, and uh, in this job over the past year, I've become quite familiar with the 71 Immigration Act, uh, it absolutely put in statute the right of the people of the Windrush generation to be here. What it did not provide them with was the evidence that they needed in order to be able to demonstrate that. Uh, and it's important that we absolutely learn that lesson and make sure we don't repeat it for our EU citizens. Kate Green. I'm grateful to the Minister. Would she not therefore agree that the conclusion to draw is that we should do both? We yeah. should have a declaratory system so that people's legal rights are absolutely clear in statute and at the same time we should have a process of giving them reliable, sustainable evidence to demonstrate that they have that right. Well, I think what we've done through the EU Settled Status Scheme is provide them with uh, the mechanism by which to demonstrate that. I have confidence in it. I recognise the challenges. We heard uh, some of the challenges in the evidence session two weeks ago, uh, and it is something that is uh, certainly something I'm determined that we do get right, that we do make it a system that people will engage in, that they will take part in and uh, be able to evidence their status going forward. Certainly. That's okay. At the same, same point, I mean, uh, during the evidence, one question that came through was that it would also be helpful to have a hard copy of that evidence. Minister. So the Honourable Gentleman will be aware that the Home Office is seeking to move to uh, digital by default in many of our processes. I absolutely recognise that this is the way forward. I spent a very happy six months at the Cabinet Office as the Minister for the Government Digital Service and recognising the delivery of services uh, digitally is the way forward and we already have with the digital right to work checks and the roll out of the digital right to rent checks a system which uh, makes sure that the individual employer or landlord can only see the evidence to which they are entitled rather than having uh, perhaps a biometric card which lays out all of a person's details it can be uh, tailored so that the uh, potential employer only gets to see uh, the evidence of the right to work. It is a system which I believe works well and certainly when I've uh, showed it to the landlord's representative panel they, uh, they engaged with it and were enthused by it and certainly for employers it has worked well but I think that uh, digital status that is backed up and can be evidence from forever going forward simply and easily is in fact much better than a, uh, a document that could potentially contains uh, the risk of fraud and a document, of course, that might need renewing every 10 years in the same way that we have to renew our passports. As I've said, uh, that this is the bill that will end free movement. That is not the place for that. Can I just finish this one point? That is not the role of the withdrawal agreement bill, which is where we will certainly enshrine citizens' rights. I'll give way to the honourable Paul Blomfield. I thank the Minister for giving way, and I share the comments on this side of the House uh, in terms of the approach that she takes to this bill and indeed to her brief. Um, but could she explain what consideration the government has given to one of the singest, single biggest national groups affected by any freedom of movement, and that's UK nationals, mm. the 1.2 million mm. uh, Brits who live and work uh, in the European Union. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you poll young people, their biggest regret about us leaving is losing their right to freedom of movement yeah. within the European Union. Minister. What assessment has she made of that issue? Because reciprocity is Minister. key. Oh, I think the Honourable Gentleman is right to point out that reciprocity is key. It's crucially important. And whilst we have it within our power here to legislate to protect the rights of the three and a half million, what we don't have is the right to legislate in France, in Germany, in Spain. And I'm absolutely conscious of the very real concerns. And we heard some of them in the evidence sessions, but uh, I've also <coughs> met repeatedly with representatives of those who are living in EU member states and, and they are worried and they are concerned and uh, we did hear the evidence uh, and I forget the, the lady's name who came and mentioned how important it was 
she felt, to have uh, citizens' rights enshrined in primary legislation. I give the same answer that I've given previously, that the withdrawal agreement bill is the place to make those uh, measures, and I'm looking forward to taking the citizens' rights elements through. But it's wrong to say that we haven't enshrined them in legislation, because, of course, through the immigration rules, we opened the settled status for phases one, two, and three, and uh, it is my duty to lay the uh, rules <coughs> for uh, opening it publicly. I'm coming to the Honourable Lady in a moment. Uh, when we open it uh, in its full system for the 30th of March. Um, and so we have, and we have enshrined them already in legislation, albeit secondary legislation. We intend to do more through secondary legislation for when the scheme opens fully. And of course, the withdrawal agreement bill will be where it is enshrined on the face of the bill. I give way to the Well, I'm and of course it will be very welcome to have them enshrined in primary legislation in the European Union withdrawal bill and then act. But of course if we don't have a withdrawal agreement, we won't have that legislation. So can the Minister say whether there are alternative plans to make sure that these rights are enshrined in primary legislation and not just subject to future change through secondary legislation without proper parliamentary scrutiny in the event that there is no deal? Minister. Well, I never think that uh, honourable members opposite let me get away with anything without proper scrutiny. Um, however, uh, she's very conscious of my position, is that I want to see the withdrawal uh, bill passed. I think it's an important step. I am uh, most enthusiastic, keen, nay, desperate for us to get a deal, uh, and I think it is absolutely crucial that we do so. But I still firmly hold that that is the place, rather than this bill, which is a simple, straightforward bill to end free movement, is the place to enshrine it. Uh, this bill and the powers that it contains on free movement will, of course, be required both in a deal and in a no-deal scenario. But they will be used differently, as in a deal it will be the withdrawal agreement bill that provides the protections for a resident population. The power in Clause 4, which we're not actually debating at the moment, but it was briefly raised, uh, but we will come on to probably later today, is similar to that found in other immigration legislations and can only be used in consequence of or in connection with part one of this bill, which is about ending free movement. I therefore do not regard that there is a risk that it could be used to change immigration legislation for non-EEA nationals in ways that are unconnected to part one of this bill. Uh, we have been clear that after exit, and this is in response to the points made by the Honourable Lady for Stratford and Urmston, that there will be no change to the way EU citizens can prove their right to work. They will continue to use, as they do now, a passport or an ID card until the future system is in place. And of course I have been uh, quite clear the future system is uh, one that will come in after 2021. It is one that we will uh, engage with widely and will set in place one which gives us a skills-based immigration system which enables us to move forward absolutely uh, accommodating the needs of our economy, hopefully, uh, and I've been candid about this from my first day in the Home Office, hopefully in a much simpler way. When you're confronted with a thousand pages of immigration rules, uh, there certainly is, and I will just in a moment give way to the Honourable Lady, there is the opportunity uh, certainly to simplify enormously. I don't pretend that I have it within my power to do a pickles on the immigration rules in the same way that he tore up a thousand pages of planning guidance and reduced the national planning policy framework, but I think we have to move forward with a system that is far more simple and easy to understand uh, than what we currently have. I give way to the Honourable Lady. I'm very grateful. I wonder if the Minister would take the opportunity to put on the record in this committee reassurance to employers that provided they've looked at a passport or identity document in this period up until 2021, they will not commit any criminal offence if it happens that that individual whose documentation they've looked at does not in practice have the right to work because they've arrived uh, after Brexit date and have not applied as they needed to for European temporary leave to remain. Uh, so I'd just like to say to the Honourable Lady, there is a terrible phrase, one which I uh, really dislike using, which is that of a statutory excuse. And if an employer has seen the evidence which indicates that somebody has the right to work in the same way as they do now, so by uh, examining an EU passport or ID card, then that provides them with the protection which she is seeking. Uh, but I think on that point, uh, Mr Stringer, I have concluded the remarks that I would like to make. Oh, OK. Can I just uh, ask the Minister again, the question I'd raised was, could the government use the powers in the bill to amend immigration legislation affecting non-EU citizens? 
Well, I think Mr. I uh, responded to that point uh, just a few moments ago that uh, we do not regard that there is a risk that the power could be used to change the immigration legislation for non-EA nationals in ways that are unconnected to part one of the bill, and I would remind him that part one is specifically about ending free movement. The question is that clause one stand part of the bill. As many as are of that opinion say aye. 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 Of the contrary, no. 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 Division. Division in room 12. The ayes were 10, the noes were 9, so the ayes have it, the ayes have it, unlock. We now come to Schedule 1, which was debated as with Clause uh, 1, and I will therefore put the question on Schedule 1 without any further debate. The question is that Schedule 1 be the first schedule to the Bill, as many as are of that opinion say aye. 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 Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. We now come to Amendment 29 to Clause 2, with which it will be convenient to discuss Amendment 28. Sure, madam. Thank you, Mr. Amendment 29, 28. Mr Stringer, Clause 2 concerns the special status of Irish citizens in UK immigration law. I think it's probably fair to say that although we often refer to the common travel area and that we know roughly how it works in practice and have a broad idea of the practical reasons as to why it exists, the actual law here is pretty obscure, vague and not very well understood. Um, and I apologise if I have uh, maligned any members of the committee who are in fact <laughs> experts in, in, in this area of immigration. Anyway, in recent years it probably hasn't really been a concern uh, largely because, of course, free movement means it hasn't really mattered. Uh, but that all now changes if free movement is, in the end, stopped, and Clause 2 is one of the steps we need to take to make sure the status of Irish citizens here is protected. So parts of Clause 2 are welcome, uh, because without Clause 2, uh, in, Irish, in law, Irish citizens could still come to the UK without immigration control if they were coming from another part of the CPA. However, without Clause 2 in law, if free movement <coughs> ended, Irish citizens would have no such right if they arrived in the UK from outside the common travel area, whether on a plane from New York or a train from Paris. Clause 2 confirms the right of Irish citizens to enter and remain without permission, even if free movement rights end, irrespective of where they have entered the UK from, unless they are subject to a deportation order, exclusion order, or an international travel ban. But the question is, Mr Stringer, does Clause 2 go far enough? And I think the evidence that we received in writing and we heard at our hearing suggests that it does not. There are other aspects of the special status that we need to have a look at as well. And indeed, there appears to be one sense in which Clause 2 appears to undermine um, the special status afforded to Irish citizens, and that is in relation to deportation, to which I will turn first. As Professor Ryan pointed out in his evidence, as drafted Clause 2 provides that Irish citizens may be deported under the general deportation laws of this country uh, in the Immigration Act 1971. Those are the deportation provisions that apply to everybody else. So firstly, there's the power to deport a person whose deportation the Secretary of State deems conducive to the public good, including the controversial mandatory provisions of the UK Borders Act 2007. 
Secondly, a person uh, whom a court recommends for deportation at the time of conviction for a criminal <coughs> offence punishable by imprisonment. And thirdly, the family member of a person who is or has been ordered to be deported. Clause 2 would also introduce a new specific power to exclude Irish citizens from the United Kingdom if the Secretary of State considers that to be conducive to the public good. But in doing so, Mr Stringer, uh, the Bill does not imply any particular special protection in terms of a threshold for deportation or exclusion of Irish citizens. And yet, the stated policy of the Government in 2007 was, according to the then Home Secretary, that Irish citizens will only be considered for deportation where a court has recommended deportation in sentencing, or where the Secretary of State concludes, due to the exceptional circumstances of the case, the public interest requires deportation. That is a higher test than the one that Clause 2 would apply. So there is a suggestion in the evidence that we've heard that Clause 2 is actually watering down the position of Irish citizens. And in this regard, Mr Stringer, it might also be useful to note that by virtue of their exemption from Irish immigration law, British citizens are completely immune from de deportation and exclusion under Irish law. And indeed, some of the other evidence that we heard from a, a, or, or were sent from a group of academics um, have gone further and they ask that if Irish citizens are, quote, not foreign in terms of the Ireland Act 1949, then why do we need to retain uh, the power to deport at all? Uh, because Irish haven't um, retained the equivalent power. Professor Ryan also raises a further very important question about whether, in order to comply with the Belfast Agreement, there should be an exemption from deportation and exclusion for Irish citizens who are from Northern Ireland. Under the Belfast Agreement, um, both governments recognised the birthright of all the people of Northern Ireland to identify themselves and be accepted as Irish or British or both, as they may so choose. As Professor Ryan puts it, there is a risk that, as formulated, the deportation and exclusion clauses will fail to respect the right of a person from Northern Ireland who wishes to identify as an Irish citizen. He questions whether it is compatible to require a person from Northern Ireland to assert their British identity in order to resist deportation from there to Ireland. There might even be circumstances in which um, the UK nationality had been renounced. So those are the issues that Amendment 28 is designed to address. The amendment simply seeks, on the one hand, to enshrine what is supposedly government practice just now into law instead of watering down that standard in relation to deportation. And secondly, it seeks to ensure that Clause 2 does not in any way undermine the Belfast Agreement. I'm sure everyone in this room would agree that it's important that we get these things right. And uh, my final observation in that regard is that, according to Professor Ryan, there is no, as I've said already, there is no provision in Irish law for UK nationals to be deported. Mr. Stringer, Amendment 29 probes the government to explain what exactly will be the position of Irish nationals who seek to have family members join them if and when the normal family rules in the immigration rules um, are applied to them. As we'll come to later in the debates, perhaps it's a day or Thursday, I absolutely hate those draconian and restrictive rules, but at least they are there, allowing British citizens and settled persons to be joined by family members. As Professor Ryan points out, Immigration rules will allow for UK citizens returning to the UK to be accompanied by non-UK or Irish family. It will also allow for UK citizens and settled persons already here to be joined by non-UK and Irish family. Now that last bit should apply simply enough for Irish nationals as well because Clause 2 if passed would appear to mean that Irish persons would be treated as settled persons for the purposes of the rule. It would be good if the Minister could just confirm that that is the case. The second problem is that, as drafted, it seems that Irish persons moving here with such family would not be able to use the rules in the way a UK citizen could because they would not yet be settled persons. The Irish person would actually need to come here first, become settled, and then the family would join them later. Another issue is whether the rules in other respects will treat the family members of an Irish citizen in precisely the same way as they treat family members of UK citizens. In particular, Mr Stringer, um, if a UK national has a UK national child here, as we all know, the child would not cause a financial threshold to increase if there was any application being made by an overseas spouse to join them. So the question again, would an Irish citizen child of an Irish citizen result in the financial threshold for any spouse coming to join that family be increased as a result of that child's presence in this country? <coughs> so this amendment seeks simply to ensure that Irish citizens could be treated in the same way for the purposes of uh, as you as UK nationals. I'm not going to actually push 29 to a vote, however, as the Committee on the Administration of Justice, which is a cross-community human rights organisation from Northern Ireland, have rightly pointed out to me that it may actually need to tweak in order to ensure um, that it does not stop Irish citizens benefiting from the more favourable treatment that EU families might continue to enjoy 
for a period through retained EU law when compared with UK citizens and settled persons encumbered with the immigration rule. So instead of precluding different treatment as the amendment does now, it should probably actually preclude less favourable treatment. Um, the Committee on Administrative Justice goes further in its submission supporting the view that the human right of the Human Rights Commission's um, that the common travel area is, quote, written in the sand and warning of other gaps, including in relation to social rights. So in conclusion, uh, Mr Stringer, the questions that I have for the Minister, why do we seem to be watering down the rights of Irish nationals, including in terms of deportation? Are the provisions in danger of undermining the Belfast Agreement in relation to people in Northern Ireland? Why not simply put current government practice into statute in relation to deportation? What provisions will there be for families of Irish nationals in future? Um, and is she willing to revisit this issue so that we can ensure the status of Irish citizens is being properly and comprehensively protected and not left to obscure practices <coughs> and rules that are written in the sand? Yeah, yeah. Amendment 29, clause 2, as on the amendment paper. The question is that the amendment uh, be made. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, again, uh, I echo the words that the previous speaker has said, and there are a couple of questions uh, you actually want to ask the Minister. In essence, we agree that uh, close to is necessary, but it requires some improvements. So the question I would like uh, to address the Minister would be this. Uh, the Good Friday Agreement grants people born in Northern Ireland <coughs> the right to identify as and to be accepted as exclusively Irish, exclusively British, or both Irish and British. Does the reference to Irish citizens in this bill and therefore the Immigration Act 1971, include Northern Ireland-born Irish citizens who do not identify as British. The second question is, the existence of Clause 2 highlights the fact that many of the associated rights of the common travel area are only provided for by virtue of free movement. When will common travel area rights be legislated for to ensure it is maintained upon a clear legal footing, if not in this bill? And the final question to the Minister is, will the Minister make explicit on the face of the bill that the people in Northern Ireland who identify exclusively as Irish, as is their right under the Belfast Agreement, are exempt from deportation and exclusion? Thank you, Mr Stringer. Uh, I would like to thank Honourable Members for raising the important issues linked to Irish citizens. And it's important to recognise that British and Irish citizens have enjoyed a status and specific rights in each other's countries since the 1920s as part of the common travel area arrangements, which is why Clause 2 protects the status of Irish citizens. Under this clause, when free movement ends, Irish citizens will continue to be able to come to the UK without requiring permission and without any restrictions on how long they can stay. British citizens enjoy reciprocal rights in Ireland. This clause provides legal certainty and clarity for Irish citizens by inserting a new section, 3ZA, into the Immigration Act of 1971. This new section will ensure that Irish citizens can enter and remain in the UK without requiring permission, regardless of where they have travelled from. This is already the position for those entering the UK from within the common travel area, but Irish citizens travelling to the UK from outside the CTA currently <coughs> end up under the EEA regulations. This clause will remove that distinction by giving Irish citizens a clear status. Turning to the specific amendments tabled by the Honourable Members for Cumberland Hill Scythe and Kirkintilloch East and Paisley and Renfrewshire North, Amendment 29 seeks to legislate that the immigration rules cannot treat family members of Irish citizens differently to family members of British citizens. While the common travel area arrangements have never included rights for the family members of British and Irish citizens, which is an approach we intend to maintain, the unique status of Irish citizens means they are considered settled from the day they arrive in the United Kingdom. This means that Irish citizens in the UK are able to sponsor family members in the same way as British citizens. This is the position for, all those, for those of all nationalities within the UK who are settled. I would also like to note that Irish citizens, in line with other EU nationals, are able to be joined in the UK by family members under the terms of the EU settlement scheme. If this amendment were accepted, it would prevent Irish citizens from being able to do so. And just to be absolutely clear on this, Irish citizens are not required to apply for status under the EU settlement scheme to benefit from the family member rights. But if they wish to apply, they can do so. So under the settlement scheme, in a deal scenario, close family members who are not already resident in the UK will be able to join, will be able to join an EU citizen, including Irish citizens, under the same conditions as now where the relationship pre-existed before the end of the implementation period. 
I would therefore ask the Honourable Member for Cumbernil, Kilsyth and Kirkintilloch East to consider withdrawing their amendment for the reasons outlined. Turning to Amendment 28, which seeks to legislate for additional provision with regards to the deportation and exclusion of Irish citizens and their family members. I would like to use this opportunity to reiterate our approach to deporting Irish citizens in light of the historical community and political ties between the UK and Ireland, along with the existence of the common travel area. Irish citizens are only considered for deportation where a court has recommended deportation following conviction or where the Secretary of State concludes, due to the exceptional circumstances of the case, the public interest requires deportation. We carefully assess all deportation decisions on a case-by-case -case basis with all the facts of the case taken into account. I confirm that the Government is fully committed to maintaining this approach in response to questions raised during the second reading of the Bill. In this regard, committee members will have noted that we are making provision to ensure that once we leave the EU, Irish citizens will be exempt from the automatic deportation provisions for criminality in the UK Borders Act 2007. This exemption is contained in the Immigration, Nationality and Asylum EU Exit Regulations, which were laid on the 11th of February. Therefore, subsections 6 and 8 of Amendment 28 are not needed. As I've outlined, the UK's approach is to only deport Irish citizens in exceptional circumstances or where the court has recommended it. This means that a family member of an Irish citizen would not be considered for deportation unless a deportation was order was made in respect to the citizen in line with our approach. I would also like to emphasise that the common travel area rights have always provided solely for British and Irish citizens. They've never specifically extended to the family members of British or Irish citizens, and we intend to maintain this approach. With subsection 8 in mind, Mr Chairman, firstly, could I please make it absolutely clear that the UK is fully committed to upholding the Belfast Agreement and respects the right of people of Northern Ireland to identify as Irish, British or both, and to hold both British and Irish citizenship as they choose. I recognise the centrality of these arguments, uh, of these citizenship and identity provisions to the Belfast Agreement. As I've said, deportation decisions are taken on a case-by-case -case basis and considers the seriousness of the criminality and whether it is in the public interest to require deportation. Recognising the citizenship provisions in the Belfast Agreement, we would consider any case extremely carefully and not seek to deport a person of Northern Ireland who is solely an Irish citizen. However, I recognise the interest on this issue from the Honourable Member and will continue to keep this under consideration. I therefore would respectfully ask him to consider withdrawing his amendment for the reasons outlined. Sure, MacDonald. Thank you very much. Mr Stringer, I'm grateful to the Minister for her, her detailed response. Um, as I ex uh, accepted during my, my first speech, um, the amendment number 29 is not perfect. Um, I also uh, accept the, the general reassurances that, that the Minister has given in relation to um, the treatment of Irish citizen families in, in the United Kingdom. Um, so I will withdraw this now and, and give further reflection to the position. In relation to what she said in relation to deportations and my amendment 28, it seemed to me, for the most part, we were saying exactly the same things, but um, the, the statements that the, both Minister and I made are better reflected in my amendment than they are in, in the currently drafted uh, clause. So uh, we seem to be saying the same thing, but the conclusion that we reach about how, how to enshrine this in, in, in law is different. Um, it seems to me that what I am asking the government to do is simply put its own current practice onto the face of the statute. So um, I will give further thought to, to that particular issue. Um, and in due course, I, I may withdraw um, Amendment 28 or I may put it to the vote, but I need to give that further thought. But for now, I, I beg your leave to withdraw Amendment 29. Does the committee agree that the amendment be withdrawn? Aye. Aye. Amendment 5, leave withdrawn. I wasn't clear from the Honourable Member whether he was wishing to move Amendment 28 or not. Amendment 28 to Clause 2, as on the amendment paper, the question is that the amendment be made. As many as are of that opinion say aye. 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 Of the contrary, no. No. Division.
Longfield. Aye. Jack Bratton. No. Maria Caulfield. No. Tracy Crouch. No. Nick Baker. Aye. Glenn Davis. No. David Digger. No. Kate Green. Aye. Asphalt Khan. Aye. Stuart MacDonald. Aye. Alison McGovern. Aye. Rachel McLean. No. Paul Maynard. No. Gavin Newland. Aye. Caroline Noakes. No. Alok Sharma. No. Alan Smith. Aye. Nick Thomas Simmons. Aye. The eyes were nine, the nose were ten, so the nose have it, the nose have it. Unlock. We now come to clause two. The question is that clause two stand part of uh, the bill. Does the Minister wish to say anything? Minister? Thank you, Mr Stringer. As I said in my response to the amendments tabled by the Honourable Members for Cumberland, Consite and Kirk and Tillich East and Paisley and Renfrewshire North, this clause protects the status of Irish citizens in the UK when free movement ends. Without this clause, as was explained by Professor Ryan when he provided evidence to the committee, when free movement ends, Irish citizens will need to seek permission to enter the UK when arriving from outside the common travel area. I am sure all <coughs> members of this committee would agree with me that this would be wholly unacceptable. And I welcome the written evidence from, in addition to Professor Ryan, the Committee on the Administration of Justice, who note that this clause is designed to remedy the gap for Irish citizens being able to enter and reside in the UK from outside the CTA. And Dr DeMars, Mr Murray, Professor O'Donoghue and Dr Warwick, who highlight that this clause will help to clarify and simplify travel rights under the common travel area. As I said earlier, the Government is clear that Irish citizens should <coughs> not be subject to immigration control unless they are subject to a deportation order or exclusion order, as now, or are subject to an international travel ban. These exceptions are set out in this new clause. These exceptions reflect current and long-standing practice. I want to confirm our approach to deporting Irish citizens only where there are exceptional circumstances or where a court has recommended deportation in a criminal case. Well, I will do. Drew MacDonald. That is a copy of the matter, which is confirming an approach which appears to be different to the one that's in clause two of the bill. Why not just put the government's approach onto the face of the bill? Minister. Well, the honourable gentleman will be aware that he just lost a division on that. I'm sure this is something that will come well, back uh, when <laughs> we reach report stage. Uh, but whilst he uh, considers that his drafting may be better than those of my Home Office officials, I must take a contrary view. I did confirm this approach in response to questions raised during the second reading of the bill, and committee members will have noted we've made provision that once we leave the EU, Irish citizens will be exempt from the automatic deportation provisions for criminality in the UK Borders Act 2007. This clause amends Section 9 of the Immigration Act 1971 to provide that restrictions placed on those who enter the UK from the CTA by order under that section do not apply to Irish citizens. Further, it amends Schedule 4 to the Immigration Act 1971, which deals with the integration of UK law and the immigration law of the islands Jersey, Guernsey and the Isle of Man. That schedule provides broadly that leave granted or refused in the islands has effect as leave granted or refused in the UK. The amendments in Clause 2 disapply those provisions in relation to Irish citizens, as they do not require leave under this clause. They also make it lawful for an Irish citizen unless, of course, they are subject to a deportation or exclusion order, to enter the UK from the islands regardless of their status in the islands. This clause aims to support the wider reciprocal rights enjoyed by British and Irish citizens in the other state. Citizens will continue to be able to work and study, access health care and social security benefits, and vote in certain elections when in the other states. I do want to reiterate that once free movement rights end, Irish citizens of the UK will be able to bring family members to the UK on the same basis as a British citizen, citizen because they are considered to be settled from day one that they arrive in the UK. I will do. Mary Caulfield. Um, Minister, forgive me, would you confirm that that is also the case in Northern Ireland in the spirit of the Good Friday Agreement for Irish citizens in Northern Ireland? And my yes, honourable friend is right to wish to emphasise that point, and it is absolutely also the case in Northern Ireland, and we take the provisions in the Belfast Agreement very seriously indeed. 
This clause, uh, as I've just indicated, supports the citizenship provisions in the Belfast Agreement, which enables the people of Northern Ireland to identify and hold citizenship as British, Irish or indeed both. And I would like to confirm that this bill makes no changes to the common travel area or how people enter the UK from within it. Section 1.3 of the Immigration Act 1971 ensures there are no routine immigration controls on these routes. I'm sure that given the unique and historic nature of our relationship with Ireland and our long-standing common travel area arrangements, members will agree on the importance of this clause as we bring free movement to an end. And I beg to move that Clause 2 stands part of the bill. The question is that Clause 2 stands part of the bill. As many as are of that opinion say aye. 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 Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We now come to Clause 3. The question is that Clause <coughs> 3 stands part of the bill. Minister? Thank you, Mr Stringer. This clause is minor and technical in nature, but is important for the implementation of the bill and for a fully functioning statute book. Subsection 1 ensures that this bill, when enacted, will be covered by any reference to the Immigration Acts. These are the Acts of Parliament that govern the UK's immigration system and which, for example, enable grants of leave to enter and remain and for the deportation of individuals. References to the Immigration Acts can be found across the statute book. For example, Section 55 of the Borders, Citizenship and Immigration Act 2009 requires that functions conferred by virtue of the Immigration Acts are discharged, having regard to the need to safeguard and promote the welfare of children in the UK. This clause will ensure that functions conferred by regulations under this Bill must be discharged according to that duty in relation to the best interests of children. This provision is standard for an Immigration Bill. Clauses with the same effect, purpose and effect are included in previous Immigration Acts for example, Section 73 of the Immigration Act 2014 and Section 92 of the Immigration Act 2016 both provide that those acts are included in the definition of Immigration Acts. Subsection 2 clarifies that this bill is not retained EU law. This means that it is not party of, part of the body of law that will have been saved <coughs> in UK law by the EU Withdrawal Act 2018. It is important to make clear that this bill cannot be treated as retained EU law. For example, this bill cannot be amended by the deficiencies power under Section 8 of the EU Withdrawal Act or any other powers aimed at dealing with retained EU law. I beg to move that Clause 3 stand part of the bill. The question is that Clause 3 stand part of the bill. As many as are of that opinion say aye. 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 Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We come now to Amendment 4, to Clause 4, with which it will be convenient to discuss Amendments 1, 11, 2, 3, 5, 6, 12, 7 and 10. Stuart MacDonald. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Stringer. I beg to move Amendment 4 and various other amendments in this group that are in my name and the name of my old friend for Paisley and Renfrewshire. Uh, no, Mr Stringer, it was a little while after my first election in 2015 that I first heard the term Henry VIII clause, um, but I've become very familiar in the, the interim. The clauses in the 2016 Immigration Act were outrageous enough, but they are small beer compared to the powers that the government has been helping itself to in the Withdrawal Act and in this. But there is no need to take my word for it. We have ample evidence, and these amendments are largely based on submissions from the Law Society of Scotland and, of course, the report of the House of Lords Committee on Delegated Legislation. Uh, I'm very grateful to both. Um, it's unusual to have the benefit of the Lords Committee report for a Commons Bill, um, but it has certainly proved very helpful. As that committee says, the combination of the subjective test of appropriateness, the words in connection with part one, the subject matter of part one, and the large number of persons who will be affected by these powers makes this a very significant delegation of power from Parliament to the Executive. The scope of this broad power is expanded even further by subsections two to five of clause four. So my submission, Mr Stringer, is that if we are serious about our role as legislators and serious about separating the Executive from the legislator, we need to start putting our foot down and reining in um, these clauses. Otherwise, what on earth are we here for? So we can start in that process through Amendment 4 by replacing the subjective test of appropriateness with in connection with, and then we can through Amendment 1 ditch a phrase in connection with. The committee was absolutely scathing here. 
It said, we are frankly disturbed that the government should consider it appropriate to include the words in connection with. This would confer uh, permanent powers on ministers to make whatever legislation they considered appropriate, provided there was at least some connection with part one, however tenuous, and to do so by negative procedure regulations, assuming no amendment was made to primary legislation. Mr. Finger, Amendment 2 is also from the House of Lords Committee's recommendations and removes Clause 4, Subclause 5. It noted that Subclause 5 confers broad discretion on ministers to levy fees or charges on any person seeking leave to enter or remain in the UK who, pre-exit, would have had free movement rights under EU law. And it recommended removal unless the government can provide a proper and explicit justification for its inclusion and explain how they intend to use the powers. So that's the, the challenge for the minister this morning. As to the government's justifications in the memorandum on delegated powers that these are all needed to protect EEA citizens, the committee, it's fair to say, was not persuaded. It said, we believe that transitional arrangements to protect existing legal rights of EEA nationals should appear on the face of the bill and not simply left to regulations with no opportunity for parliamentary scrutiny until after they've been made and come into force. Now, of course, that is exactly what opposition MPs have sought to do with other amendments that we will come to later on. The consequence of that for the committee um, was that there would be no need to use the made affirmative procedures set out in Clause 4, Subclause 6, and it recommended removal of that Subclause 2, which is what my Amendments 3 and 5 seek to do. The very unusual made affirmative procedure means that the regulations are actually in force when they are tabled in the House of Commons before we have even voted on them. So our position is that the more common made affirmative procedures should be followed instruments laid in draft and not coming into force until we actually examine and approve them, hence amendments 6 and 7. So let me just conclude, Mr Stringer, with um, the comments of the Law Society of Scotland. It says, the abrogation of parliamentary scrutiny is deeply concerning. The cum cumulative effect of these provisions is to reduce the level of parliamentary scrutiny of legislation relating to immigration, both EU and non-EU. For, so for all these reasons, I I hope the government will listen carefully and rein in its uh, own um, desires for extensive delegated powers under Clause 4. Yeah. Amendment 4 to Clause 4, that's on the amendment paper. The question is that the amendment uh, 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 Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'd also like to move the amendment 11, 12 and 10. Uh, throughout the Brexit process, the government has been carrying out a power grab acquiring powers to amend primary and secondary legislations with little parliamentary scrutiny. The debates on Brexit legislation has shown that there is a cross-party support for limiting Henry VIII powers. Backbenchers on all sides of the House recognise that Parliament's role in making legislation is crucial and must be protected. We accept that there will be aspect of secondary legislation which the government will need to adjust as a result of ending of free movement. We need a functional statute book. However, there must be limits on these powers to ensure ministers cannot make significant policy changes, including to primary legislation through statutory instrument. Currently, scrutiny of secondary legislation is weak. Statutory instruments are unamendable, and the government has a majority on all SI's committees. That is, if the SI even gets a committee. Those subject to the negative procedure may never even be discussed by parliamentarians, as Adrian Barry said in our evidence session. It is true that you have the affirmative resolution procedure, but it is clearly a poor substitute for primary legislation, and as the scrutiny you get in select committees, he recommended the Henry VIII powers be radically redrawn. We know that the government is planning a major overhaul of our immigration system for both EU and non-EU migrants. Set on the white paper, there is a risk that these powers could be used to bring in that entirely new system. Can the minister confirm whether the government would use the powers in the bill to bring the new system, or if there would be a new immigration bill if there will be another bill, when this might come, and would that be also in addition to a withdrawal and implementation bill if you get a withdrawal agreement? Immigration is already in an area where the government has extensive delegated powers. Since 1971, almost all major changes to our immigration system have been done through the immigration rules. 
we want to move to a situation where there is more scrutiny of immigration changes, <coughs> not less. Labor has many issues with the proposed immigration system, but we believe more broadly in the principle that such a major changes should have the chance to be fully discussed and debated before it is introduced. We are being asked to take on trust that Minister will not abuse the powers delegated to them in this clause. In the wake of Windrush, we should be particularly skeptical of this government's promises. The Windrush scandal was a result of a long period of under-the-radar changes to immigration rules, which chipped away at the rights of Windrush migrants and <coughs> threw their status in the UK into uncertainty. In the aftermath of Windrush, we should be particularly attentive to the risks of allowing ministers the power to amend people's rights after they have been debated and enshrined in a primary legislation. The clause four offers the government a blank check to change our immigration laws and reduces the level of parliamentary scrutiny of immigration legislation. Labor and SNP amendments, which we support, do four things. First, they limit the scope of the powers as currently drafted, changes to our immigration laws need only be in consequence of or in connection with the withdrawal of EU free movement legislation. We support amendment one from the SNP, which would limit the scope here, and support <coughs> amendment four, which, could, which would allow the Secretary of State to make only changes which are necessary rather than that the minister considers appropriate. The House of Lords Delegated Powers and Regulatory Committee recommended the amendments because they were disturbed by the use of in connection with, as it would confer permanent powers on ministers to make whatever legislation they considered appropriate, provided there was at least some connection with part one, however tenuous, and to do so by negative procedure regulations and Amendment 2 would prevent the Secretary of State from making changes to fees and charges. Labor has tabled in our Clause 38, which states that visa fees should only be set at a cost price. The Delegated Powers Committee raised significant concern about this subclause, as well as it, it confirms broad discretion on the Minister to levy fees or charges on any person seeking leave to enter or remain in the UK who Free exit would have had free movement rights under EU laws. Fees are already so high to be unaffordable. The Home Office makes enormous profits of visa fees, and it is and it concerning that the government is granting themselves the power to increase them even further. Second, these amendments limit the nature of these powers. Amendment 11 in my name would allow Minister to grant status to a group of EEA nationals but not allow them to remove any such rights without primary legislation. I'm grateful to the Immigration Law Practitioners Association for help drafting it. We believe this is a vital safeguard <coughs> that rights to remain should be set in stone and not subject to amended or removed by secondary legislation. And the third, these amendments improve the scrutiny that changes to immigration rules will be subject to. Subsection 6 of Clause 4 set out some immigration rules may be made by the made affirmative procedure, which means that they will be assigned into law before being laid in Parliament. There is then a period of 40 days in which the House must approve them or they cease to have effect. The House of Lords Committee recommended this be removed, which is what Amendment 3 does. Amendment 12, 13, and 7 will ensure that the immigration rules are subject to the affirmative procedure. In fact, Labor has tabled new Clause 9, which would subject them to super affirmative procedure. Our immigration rules have an enormous impact on people's lives, but often receive very little scrutiny. The made affirmative procedure means, in fact, that they will receive no scrutiny before coming into effect, and that scrutiny will only be retrospective. And the fourth, the final point is Amendment 10 would place a time limit on the Henry VIII powers in Clause 4. The government has said they will review the white paper proposal for 12 months. So this sunset clause should ensure 
that they can use the Henry VIII powers in clause four to make small amendments to legislation, but that at the point at which they will be making bigger changes, the Henry VIII powers will expire. We have serious concerns about the extent of delegated power in clause four. The amendments from Labour and the SNP would go a long way to limiting the powers and ensure changes to immigration policy are properly scrutinised. Yes. Kate Green. Thank you very much, Mr. Springer. I only want to make a very brief contribution to ask the Minister if she would place on the record uh, some more information about the government's intentions in terms of how she intends to use the scope of this legislation. As we heard from uh, the Honourable Member for Cumbernauld, Kilsyth and Kirk and Tiller East, there is potential in the language of Clause 4 around connected with and appropriate, for example, that the legislation could be used to make sweeping changes to immigration rules, not just in relation to EU nationals, but in fact across the whole of the immigration system. Um, if we look at the um, long title of the bill um, and the introductory paragraphs of it, it does say that its intention appears to be to make provisions to end rights of free movement of persons under retained EU law <coughs> or other retained EU law uh, relating to immigration and to confirm to modify retained direct EU legislation relating to social security coordination. But the devil is in the detail of and for connected purposes, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> it would be very reassuring to the committee, I think, if the Minister would place on the record this morning just exactly how widely the government intends to make use of this legislation. Tracy Crouch. Thank you very much. I, very, uh, I only very briefly wanted to stand uh, to speak unsympathetically, uh, although I'm getting excited, uh, to the <laughs> amendment that has been tabled uh, by the Honourable Lady, um, uh, Amendment 8, uh, on the um, issues around uh, 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 the minimum threshold. If this is the appropriate time. Sorry, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> I shall resume. It's been a while, Mr. Stringer, since I've been on the back benches of a. Uh... The amendments we are are Amendment 4, 1, 11, 2, 3, 5, 6, 12, 7, 8, 10, not 8. But there will be I shall contain myself. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Stringer. Um, and notwithstanding the brief contribution from my colleague, actually the Honourable Lady from Stretford and Irmson has invited me to delve into the, the detail, and that is absolutely, with your indulgement, what I'm planning to do. Uh, so it is right that this committee pays close attention to the delegated powers in the Bill, which are key to delivering the changes linked to the end of free movement. And I would like to say that I'm grateful to their Lordship's Delegated Powers and Regulatory Reform Committee for their report on the bill, and I'm considering carefully their recommendations. The power in this clause is similar to that found in many other immigration acts. It is needed for the effective implementation of the bill and the ending of free movement. A great deal has been said about this power granting ministers a blank cheque, slightly 20th century analogy, but it's the one that I've used as well, uh, and I should maybe be talking about... Um, chip and pin or perhaps contactless, uh, but I just want to explain exactly how the power can be used and how it cannot. And if you will allow me, Mr Chairman, there is quite a lot of detail I would like to cover. So I would like to begin by reassuring the committee that with Clause 4, the Government is seeking to ensure we can manage the transition of EEA nationals, Swiss and their family members from free movement into our domestic immigration system. If you will permit me, Mr Chairman, I'm going to refer to them collectively as EEA nationals purely for the sake of brevity during this debate. Firstly, the power will enable us to protect the status of EEA nationals and their family members who are resident in the UK before exit day and ensure their residence rights are not affected by the UK's departure from the EU. For example, it will enable us to save the operation of otherwise repealed legislation, such as Section 7 of the Immigration Act 1988, which relates to the requirement to have leave to enter or remain in the UK and the EEA Regulations 2016, which implement the Free Movement Directive. This will preserve the position of EEA nationals in the UK before exit day, or any agreed implementation period, so that they do not require leave to enter or remain until the deadline for obtaining leave under the EU Settlement Scheme passes, June 2021 or December 2020 in the sad event of a no deal. Secondly, it will enable us to make provision for EEA nationals who arrive after exit day in the unlikely event we leave the EU without a deal, 
but before the future border and immigration system is rolled out from January 2021. During this transition period, this clause will enable us to, for example, ensure that EEA nationals need only provide their passport or other national ID document as evidence of their right to work or rent, as is currently the case. We need this power to ensure that prior to the future system being implemented in 2021, EEA nationals can be treated as they are currently in terms of checking for eligibility for benefits and public services and the right to work and rent property. This clause is needed to enable us to meet the UK's obligation under the draft withdrawal agreement if that is agreed. In the event of no deal, the clause will enable us to implement the government's policy in the paper Citizens' <coughs> Rights in the event of a no deal Brexit, which was published by the Department for Exiting the EU on the 6th of December last year. Thirdly, this power will enable us to align the immigration treatment of EEA and non-EEA nationals in the future so that we can create a level playing field in terms of who can come to the UK. For example, the power will enable us to align the position of EU nationals and that of non-EU nationals in relation to the deportation regime, where currently a different threshold applies to the deportation of EU national criminals. As I've said previously, we are engaging extensively on the design of the future system and our proposals were set out in the white paper. The details of the future system will be set out in the immigration rules once they have been agreed. But without this power in the clause, we cannot deliver that future system, and that is why it is crucial to the overall implementation of the bill. Fourthly, this power is important to ensure that our laws work coherently once we have left the EU. There are references across the statute book to EEA nationals, their free movement rights, or their status under free movement law. The power needs to be wide enough to ensure that all such references can be adequately addressed as a consequence of ending free movement. By way of example, Section 126 of the Nationality, Immigration and Asylum Act 2002 lists the documents that must be provided in support of various types of immigration application. One example relates to applications under the EEA Regulations 2016. An amendment is needed to remove this reference because in the future there will no longer be applications under the <coughs> EEA regulations as those regulations are repealed by this bill. I would now like to respond to amendments 1 to 5 tabled in the name of the Honourable Member for Cumberland, Kilsyth and Kirkintillock East. Amendment 4, as he has explained, seeks to limit the Secretary of State's power to make regulations where it is necessary to do so rather than where it is appropriate. I would like to reassure the committee this isn't a blank check. The regulations can only be used to make provision in consequence of or in connection with part one of the bill. That means the changes can only be in connection with the end of free movement or the status of Irish citizens. The changes must be appropriate within this context, so the scope of the power is already limited, even without it being limited to what is necessary. But necessary is a test that it is not only harder to meet, it is also harder to say whether it is met. To explain why I regard necessary as too high a bar, I refer to the courts, who have said that the nearest paraphrase for necessary is really needed. Such a test would be too restrictive. One person's necessary amendment is another's nice to have. Immigration is a very litigious area, and we do not want a provision which leads to uncertainty and challenge about whether an amendment is appropriate or necessary. The committee may recall this point was discussed at some length during the passage of the EU Withdrawal Act 2018, and Parliament agreed that appropriate was the correct formulation when dealing with amendments in relation to EU exit. It is the right test here also. I now turn to Amendment 1, which seeks to limit the changes made under the regulations to those which are in consequence of the ending of free movement rather than in connection with or in consequence of the ending of free movement. I note that this amendment was recommended by the Delegated Powers and Regulatory Reform Committee. As I've explained, references to EEA nationals occur in numerous places across the entire statute book and in numerous different ways, not always by reference to free movement rights. <coughs> The inclusion of in connection with is more appropriate to describe the provision that needs to be made for some of these cases. It is also better suited for making transitional provision for those who arrive in the UK after the commencement of the bill than in consequence of. If I may, Mr Chairman, I also want to address a point specifically made by their Lordship's committee. They said that transitional and savings provisions for pre-exit day EEA <coughs> nationals should be made on the face of the bill. This is something honourable members are interested in, and we heard some of the witnesses discuss it during the evidence sessions. We have committed to protecting the rights of EU citizens who are resident in the UK. 
This has been our priority, and we have delivered this through our negotiations with the EU to secure protections of citizens' rights, which are included in the draft withdrawal agreement. If that is agreed by Parliament, there will be legislation to implement it in UK law. The withdrawal agreement bill will be the vehicle through which such protections are delivered. We have also opened the EU settlement scheme to allow EU nationals who are already living in the UK to obtain settled status or pre-settled status in the UK. This will provide them with a clear status once free <coughs> movement ends and will ensure their rights are protected in UK law. In addition, we have given unilateral assurances that EU nationals and their family members resident in the UK can stay if the UK leaves the EU without a deal, as set it out in the No Deal <coughs> policy paper I previously mentioned. In the event of no deal, we will use this power in Clause 4 to make provision to protect the status of EU nationals resident in the UK. One could speculate as to whether such protections are necessary or merely appropriate. One could also speculate as to whether such protections are in consequence of the end of free movement or only connected to the end of free movement. However, I know that, like me, members of this committee agree it is important to be able to protect EU nationals, and I want to ensure that this clause is broad enough to, be able, to enable us to do so. Turning to Amendment 11, I'm grateful to the Honourable Member for Manchester Gorton for raising an important issue which seeks to replace part of the power in subsection 4 of Clause 4. This power allows us to make provisions applying to persons not exercising free movement rights. The amendment appears to narrow, or perhaps clarify, the power by including reference to the grant of leave to enter. It may be helpful if I first explain our intended use of this provision. I am aware there is a perception that this subsection would allow the Secretary of State to make sweeping changes to the immigration system in respect of non-EEA nationals. But I want to assure the committee that is not the case. Clause 4, subsection 4, does not provide a standalone power. It is part and parcel of the power in subsection 1 that we have previously debated. This means that it can only be used in consequence of or in connection with part 1 of the bill. That is about the repeal of free movement and the status of Irish nationals. There is no risk that the power could be used to change the immigration legislation for non-EEA nationals in ways unconnected with part one of this bill. Subsection four is needed because not every person who is an EEA national in the UK is exercising free movement rights. EU law sets out the conditions for the exercise of such rights and a good example is that if a person is not working, seeking work, self-employed or studying, then they can only exercise free movement rights if they have adequate resources and have comprehensive sickness insurance. So putting aside any rights as a family member, a German house husband, or indeed wife, who does not have comprehensive sickness insurance is not exercising free movement rights. We have taken the decision to be generous in our treatment of EU nationals already in the UK, and we have opened the EU settlement scheme to them all, regardless of whether they are exercising treaty rights or not. However, we need to make sure that we have the power to amend other legislation to facilitate this. For example, checks on right to work or access to benefits and public services that might otherwise apply to them. The effect of the Honourable Member's amendment may be to prevent us from making these cha changes, potentially meaning that this group could fall through the gaps. I would also like to reiterate that this power is not the means by which the future border and immigration system will be delivered. That will be through the immigration rules made under the Immigration Act 1971. I'm sure that the Honourable Member for Manchester Gorton does not intend for this group to be denied protection, and I hope I have provided sufficient reassurance on the need for and use of this subsection. I would therefore respectfully ask him to withdraw his amendment. Turning now to Amendment 2, in the name of the Honourable Member for Cumbernauld, Kilsyth and Kirkintilloch East, which seeks to narrow the scope of the power by omitting subsection 5. Their Lordship's Committee recommended that the Government justify the need for subsection 5, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to do so. Subsection 5 is to enable changes to be made to legislation that imposes fees and charges. For example, under the EU-Turkey Association Agreement, Turkish nationals are currently exempt from the immigration health surcharge. The directly effective rights under the Association Agreement, which will form part of domestic law from exit day by virtue of Section 4 of the EU Withdrawal Act 2015, are disapplied by paragraph 9 of Schedule 1 to the Bill. This would mean Turkish nationals would become liable to pay the immigration health surcharge, but we think it appropriate to maintain that exemption for those already resident in the UK. Another example of how we might rely on subsection 5 
is in relation to persons granted limited leave to remain under the EU settlement scheme. As the law currently stands, they would be considered not ordinarily resident in the UK when their free movement rights end, and they would be liable for charges when accessing <coughs> NHS treatment. We want to make it crystal clear that these EU nationals already in the UK should not be charged for NHS treatment. Without this provision, we could not use the power to make such amendments to exempt people from charges which might otherwise apply. And I hope that has provided sufficient explanation as to why subsection 5 is needed. I would therefore also request that the honourable members for Cumberland, Kilsyth and Kirk and Tillock East and for Paisley and Renfrewshire North and Manchester Gorton withdraw their amendments. We have heard from members about the level of parliamentary procedure attached to the regulations made under Clause 4, and I now would like to address that issue. If I may, Mr Chairman, I would like to address Amendments 3 and 5 together in the names of the Honourable Member for Cumberland, Kilsyth and Kirkentillock East, and on which the Honourable Member for Paisley and Renfrewshire North added his name. These amendments have the effect that the first set of regulations made under Clause 4 will use the affirmative procedure <coughs> rather than the made affirmative procedure. As members of the committee may be aware, under the made affirmative procedure, regulations are made and come into force after being signed by the Secretary of State and are then laid before Parliament. They cease to have effect if they are not then approved by both Houses of Parliament within 40 days of being made. Under the affirmative procedure, regulations cannot be made or come into force until they have been approved by both Houses of Parliament. Both of these procedures provide a significant opportunity for Parliament to scrutinise regulations made under Clause 4. But the made affirmative option for the first set out of regulations under Clause 4 allows the government to maintain the flexibility to deal with a range of potential EU exit scenarios. For example, and I believe I might have mentioned this earlier, there could be a short period between this bill receiving royal assent and the UK leaving the EU, at which point, in the event of no deal, we may want to end free movement. This would require regulations to be in place more quickly than could be achieved under the draft affirmative procedure. It is this Government's view that the use of the made affirmative procedure for the first set of regulations under Clause 4 is therefore both necessary and proportionate. It is not the case that Parliament has been denied a proper opportunity to scrutinise the regulation. Any regulations made must be approved by both Houses within 40 days, otherwise they cease to have effect. And it is for these re those reasons I respectfully ask the Honourable Member to withdraw Amendments 3 and 5. Finally, I will address Amendments 6, 7 and 12, tabled by the Honourable Member for Cumberland, Kilsyth and Kirk and Tillock East, the Honourable Member for Paisley and Revolution North, and the Honourable Member for Manchester Gorton. Each of these amendments seeks to provide that all regulations made under Clause 4 should be subject to the affirmative resolution, resolution procedure. As it currently stands, regulations made under this clause will be subject to the affirmative procedure wherever they amend or repeal primary legislation. This will ensure appropriate scrutiny over the use of this power and is consistent with the usual approach to these types of powers. Where regulations made under Clause 4 do not amend or repeal primary legislation, they will be subject to the negative resolution procedure. As members of the committee will be aware, under the negative procedure, regulations are made and come into force after being signed by the Secretary of State and cease to have effect if either House passes a motion annulling the regulations within 40 days. This is in accordance with the principle maintained by successive governments and accepted by the Delegated Powers and Regulatory Reform Committee that it is appropriate for amendments to secondary legislation to be subject to the negative resolution procedure. Using these powers does not mean avoiding parliamentary scrutiny, far from it. Secondary legislation made under Clause 4 is subject to full parliamentary oversight using well-established procedures. And I therefore ask the Honourable Members for Cumbernauld, Kilsyth and Kirkintillock East, for Paisley and Renfrewshire North and for Manchester Gorton to withdraw their amendments. Thank you very much, Mr Stringer. Um, and I'm very grateful to the Minister for her detailed response. She said she would go into the detail and she certainly did not uh, disappoint in that regard. Um, <laughs> the, the one defence that doesn't really fly with me, uh, the one defence that doesn't really fly with me is that uh, similar powers have been used in previous immigration bills and I objected very strongly to some of the powers that have uh, appeared in the previous immigration bills or certainly the, the most recent immigration bill before this one. Um, however, the Minister did give some useful example of how the powers are to be used and I think we'll all have to, to go away and think um, very carefully about what she said and reflect on whether or not that does mean there have to be uh, changes. The, the one particular amendment that I would still um, wish to push to a vote, the one where I've not been fully satisfied by the Minister's answer, is Amendment 1. Because in my view, tidying up the statute book and uh, putting in place transitional provisions, as the, the Minister gave his examples there, <coughs> would surely meet the inconsequence test 
and so the very loose in connection with test would not be needed there. And I also do agree with what the Lordship said in, in the committee report that um, transitional agreements, uh, sorry, arrangements should be on the face of the bill, first of all, to cover an ordeal scenario. Um, secondly, because that would be useful for the UK and Europe in such an ordeal scenario in trying to push other governments around um, the EU for reciprocal uh, treatment. And finally, just because having it in the face of the bill is a much safer place for it to be rather than in um, delegated legislation. Um, also, some concerns in relation to the response to Amendments 3 and 5 um, in relation to the different types of affirmative uh, procedure. I, s I still find it startling that we're even contemplating um, in an ordeal scenario an end to free movement um, within a few weeks' uh, time. I, d I just do not think this country is remotely um, ready for any such uh, prospect at all. Um, and, and, and a far more sensible option would be to um, put in place arrangements for free movement to continue, even in an ordeal scenario, until we are properly ready to, to make uh, any particular um, changes that are agreed upon. But anyway, Mr Stringer, to conclude, um, I will withdraw um, my amendment other than Amendment 1, which I would, uh, with your leave, um, continue to put to a vote Amendment 1. Right. Mr Commissioner, agree with Amendment uh, 4 be withdrawn? I beg to move Amendment 8, which stands in my name uh, and which I'm hopeful uh, may also attract at least some support uh, from the Honourable Member for Chatham and Aylesford. Um, I hope she will take the opportunity after uh, I've made my remarks to offer her observations on this amendment too. 
This amendment um, is a probing amendment, Mr Stringer. Uh, the Minister will be pleased to hear to explore some of the issues that may affect uh, personal assistance employed, employed by disabled people uh, after Brexit, and some of those personal assistance will be EEA nationals and therefore affected by the um, freedom of movement provisions in this bill. Personal assistance are people who are employed directly by disabled people themselves to meet day-to-day -day needs for assistance, whether that be personal care or for facilitating assistance. Order, order. It's now 11.25. The committee is now adjourned. Order, order. Uh, we meet again at 2 o'clock. Members wish to leave their papers here. The room will be locked over lunch. <laughs>